Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Welcome back. Uh, at this point, it's our tradition to go around the room and introduce ourselves to each other. <coughs> I'm Marvin Snow. Larry Wish. Michael. Douglas Hall. Max. Mark. Andre. Bob Sidokan. I'm Carl Wolf. Robert Golden. I'm Albert Kappa. I'm Peter. I'm Tom Bruin. I'm Joe Good. <coughs> I'm Javier. I'm Howard Deport. <coughs> Tom Thurston. I'm Brent. Mark Tilly. Bill. My name is Marty. Mark. <coughs> Richard Azalea. Jack. <coughs> Jack Busby. <laughs> I'm Keith Mortridge. I'm Ray. <coughs> Ray Dyer. Paul Shepard. I'm Harley. Girl. I'm Richard. Jerry Jones. John. Peter. Steve Blumenthal. I'm Bill Childs. Tom Grisham. I'm David Ezra. My name is Harley. I'm Robert. Clint Slater. I'm David. I'm Mike. I'm Al Sack. I'm David. George. Tim Stewart. Roy. Jim Shalcom. Chris Shelton. Joe Walsack. Anthony. Omar. David Lewis. My name is Guy. Lisa. Peter. Is that everyone? I'm Lee. <laughs> and Lee Lynn, your speaker this morning. I'm Adrian Tiller. Adrian, is there anyone here for the first or second time or returning after a long absence? Could you just mention your names one more time? Steve. Steve, welcome. Omar. Omar. Javier. Javier. Anyone else? Michael. Michael, welcome. And David, I've been here a really long time. Okay, well, welcome back. And Albert. Albert, welcome. Okay, uh, the people who have been here um, on a regular basis will be uh, meeting with you and welcoming you at the social uh, time after the speaker here at uh, noon time. This morning's speaker uh, Lee, is Lee Lip. <clears throat> uh, Lee Lip, PhD, has a therapy practice in San Francisco and supervises, supervises at the Haight Ashbury Psychological Services. She has been a member of Thich Nhat Hanh's Order of Interbeing, practicing Zen and Vipassana since 1990. She is the Diversity Outreach Coordinator for the San Francisco Zen Center. Uh, Lee teaches Transforming Depression, classes in venues that include Spirit Rock Meditation Center, Insight Meditation Society, Zen Hospice Project, Tassajara Mountain Center, and the San Francisco Zen Center. She is presently teaching at the San Francisco Mental Health Association and the San Francisco Department of Mental Health. With that introduction, Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you. I get tired when I hear. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my age, it's just the amount of activities I'm doing. <laughs> and as I listen to the description of uh, some of the things that I'm doing, um, I, I think about, gee, I'd like to add some scintillating details about my life um, that brings me more alive into the room with you. And yet, I'll just count on you to add the scintillating details from your imagination. It'd probably be a whole lot more fun anyway. Um, so, hello. I, am, I don't know how many of you know that I've been invited to come today to talk about the Prison Outreach Department at San Francisco Zen Center of which I have been in and out of working for many, many years now. And I specifically want to talk about uh, the prison correspondence program that we have 
And I will admit to you right up front, I want to hook you guys. I want to hook as many of you as possible. I want to hook your hearts. So, um, a couple of years ago, I moved out of the San Francisco Zen Center's temple building at Page and Laguna, and I moved across the street. And when I moved across the street, I moved across the street with a question that the householder, the person not living in a temple, might wonder about, certainly what I was wondering about. How will I express myself? Here I've had all of these years living at Zen Center, San Francisco Zen Center, and um, now I'm back out on the street, <laughs> so to speak. And, um, and the temple is there, and I'm living right across the street. And what am I now going to be doing to express myself? What, am, what do I have to offer? And um, and you'll probably notice it, that zenis, oftentimes, we have a lot of questions. In fact, our practice is that of questions. What's happening now? What's happening now? How can I be with this? Oh, like that. And that our tendency, our inclination, is to answer our questions with other questions. So when I say, how do I express myself, what does express mean? You know, what does myself mean? What does practice mean? Right? The questions probably a lot of you are asking. Um, what do I have to offer? What, what is I? What does offer mean? So these are the questions I carried with me into temple life when I moved in around 12, 13 years ago. And the same questions that I carried out of the temple life into um, being just a regular householder person. So um, this is actually how Baruch and Jim and I met. Um, Jim and I called each other this morning and decided to wear red. <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> and, and Baruch has kind of reddish pinkish, so we're kind of a matched trio. And um, I've known uh, the work of the Gay Buddhist Fellowship for quite some time in my work with the Prison Correspondence Program at Zen Center. And the Gay Buddhist Fellowship's newsletter goes out to many people, including those people in prison, incarcerated, who request that newsletter. Lots of newsletters go out, and I understand that a lot of people get together, or some people get together, and open letters together, and, um, and then decide, well, this person looks like they would like something other than we can offer through the mail. This person sounds like they would like our book that we send out right now, the book that's sent out is Queer Dharma, Volume 2. And sometimes the request is for somebody to keep the person company in their spiritual quest. And so when a person requests um, company or a wish for some guidance in the practice of their spirituality and what that what they can do when they're living behind bars. Mostly, the Gay Buddhist Fellowship, in this case now it's uh, Baruch, will send me a bunch of letters with filled out mailing labels, a bunch of these books, and ask Zen Center, would we please mail them to that person. And so we then send out right away, well almost right away, uh, the book, and a letter that tells them to look for the book if they've asked for the book specifically. If they haven't asked for the book specifically, the letter we send preceding sending the book is um, information about our prison project, it's in center, and that the GBF has um, wondered if they would like a book that would inform them of some of GPF's spiritual practices, or some such like that, to um, keep anonymous that they have written to a gay organization 
being gay in a lot of our jails and prisons is very dangerous. Just like it's very dangerous on some of the streets in our country or some of the streets in the world. But in this case, people can't quite get away in the same ways we have available to us. So we want to be really protective of this bit of information about this person. Oftentimes, people will write back to us and say they would like a pen pal. And um, I look to see if I can match up a person who identifies as gay with a person who's willing to be a volunteer pen pal, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, um, with someone who is gay. And oftentimes, I'm not able to find that, so I match them up with whoever else might be available. Um, so, so here is Baruch and my relationship as he carries the, the light of wishing to send information to people who write to the Gay Buddhist Fellowship. And then I meet Jim. When did we meet? What, a couple years ago? Something like that. And I met Jim also with his questions, and we were all asking the same question. How can I express myself? And what do I have to offer? And as we got to know each other, he said, well, yeah, he'd like to write to a person. And he, so you've been writing to this person for a couple of years? A couple of years. And this man that he's writing to is such a dear, sweet man. When we send him anything from the Zen Center, not only does he write to Jim about it, but he also writes to me and, and thanks us for sending him the material and um, how he's practicing. It's so... Dear, I, I can see why you're totally hooked in writing him. So, um, I don't know, as I've gotten to know these two men, wouldn't it be great if the two sanghas got together, the gay men's Buddha sangha that Jim is, represents for me, and the gay Buddhist fellowship that Baruch represents for me. Maybe I could introduce them and we could form some kind of gay men's prison outreach sangha. So we did meet, I think, a couple of times, and, and there's a new program that's going to be forming with the collaboration with San Francisco Zen Center, Gay Buddhist Fellowship, Gay Men's Buddhist Sangha, and we're going to form the GNBPN. <laughs> I wondered if I'd be able to get it all out. <laughs> and that stands for Gay Men's Buddhist Prison Network. I don't think it goes along with YMCA because it's our country. <laughs> but we might be able to work it out to make a little jingle. Um, as usual, particularly, I thought I was just there was just going to be like a handful of people that would show up that might be interested in hearing what I had to say about prison outreach. And then I got this email from, what, you sent it yesterday or the day before, saying, and so I thought I would just come and chat. And, and that's actually what I'm doing and what I like to do the best. But Baruch said, um, well, maybe I would provide a talk. So then I immediately got like, I have to provide a talk. You know, it's, it's the same thing, but it's according to how we label it, right? So sometimes I'll, I'll tease myself, and on Monday I'll say, I've decided Monday is still a part of my weekend and I carry the energy from the weekend into Monday. You know, we're making it up anyway. So <laughs> I, I might as well make it up to my day. So let's see. So we'll look at, at some of the things I want to express to you uh, from time to time. So our question, what is it that we can offer to people who are living behind bars? Lots of times I really don't know. I don't know. I'll ask myself, what is it I can offer this person? And then I realize they're offering me who they are. And that's the place where we start. Just like right now. You know, I come in, I got this absolutely phenomenal hug of warm welcome. An offering to me. Happy you're here. Glad you decided to come. I hug him back. Mm, I love that hug. It felt so good. I feel very welcome. I feel I always feel so included when I come here or to the um, gay men's Buddha Sangha. I feel so um, just loved, I guess. I guess I just feel loved and accepted. Um, so what we can 
offer to people is our practice. The practice that we offer to ourselves. I wrote being with, accepting, learning to forgive, and loving this one, this bunch of stuff, the whole bunch of stuff. That's the life that we're living. In this bunch of stuff, in this bunch of stuff. So it appears that I live across the street from Zen Center and that there's a street that separates my life from the life of those that live across the street from me. That's Zen Center. That's how we look at things in our relative way of looking at things. In our ordinary life, I start and stop here, you start and stop there. And then when we sit, what our meditation practice can uncover for us is that I just call that a street. (laughs) It isn't necessarily a street in the big picture of stuff. In the big picture of stuff, it's just like, I am Zen Center, San Francisco Zen Center. San Francisco Zen Center is me. I could call that street a hallway, just like I call Monday a part of my weekend. It's just That's all relative stuff so we can get along in our life. It isn't that's a bad thing, but it isn't the whole thing that gets uncovered for us when we sit for a while. And I notice that when I incline towards practicing stillness. I don't know if many of you have noticed that that's what gets uncovered for you, that sense of everything is kind of empty of meaning. And then... We put meaning on our lives. We put meanings on, I stop and start here, you stop and start there. We would put meanings on this bunch of stuff that we call flowers in a vase, nurtured by water, like that. Some people love white flowers, some don't. But they're just flowers after all, being who they are. So just accepting, ah, white flowers in a vase, nourished by water, that somebody lovingly put into that vase. So when we touch this deeper reality, what we often notice in the stillness is that wisdom and compassion arise. Wisdom cradled by compassion this mudra, wisdom, cradled with compassion, like that. And it's at this place that we can be really curious about the illusions that we all carry with us. The nature of the human mind, body, is to live. The nature of the mind-body is to reach out for what it is that we need. To find ways to get what we need. Food, water, housing, shelter. An activity in which we can express our sexual nature. Like that. Those are the basics of our life together. Everyone's life. Doesn't matter what side of the street doesn't matter where, whether we're living in San Francisco or Nairobi or a prison in downtown, jail in downtown San Francisco or San Quentin. This is what we all, this is where we all start. It's what we are all have in common. So it can be a very interesting question to ask ourselves, what illusions do we have about how things work? How do I forget this commonality between of all of us. You might want to notice what's happening right now. What's happening perhaps right now in your body. Just kind of check in. What is happening right now with this one? Is there an adjustment that the body needs that we maybe haven't noticed? Maybe we noticed and we're afraid to move? Just simply do what the body needs to do to feel more comfortable right now. 
And then perhaps on the next in-breath, noticing what's happening right now. And on the out-breath, what's happening right now. We don't have to do anything fancy or special. Being still, it's okay. We can simply see the questions of our heart. And um, it's from our questions that... It's with our questions that we practice realization. When we realize the questions and we practice with our questions, practice helps us realize what is actually happening. So sometimes we'll hear the expression, practice realization. <coughs> Just being still in the midst of all of our ordinary life is practicing realization. Nothing fancy. We're checking into what's actually going on, not what we make up is going on. And making up is not like a bad thing. It's a human thing. But we're kind of getting underneath our stories and our illusions and we're looking at and realizing what is actually happening. That's realization. We're already enlightened. Uncovering that we're already enlightened is practicing realization. So what is it I have to offer? Who is the I that offers? Do I offer something or is something offered through me? Um, how do I express myself? Whoops, I don't want to forget to mention that asking the questions doesn't necessarily mean that answers will arise. It <laughs> simply means that we give ourselves free range to let the questions come. <clears throat> Just let our questions come. We don't have to push any of the questions away. read something to you from this. This is a person I corresponded with. He's no longer behind bars. I corresponded with him for about six years. And when he first wrote uh, to me, now I, I pick out a few people from the stream of letters, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters that we get at San Francisco Zen Center. Hundreds of letters. And I will pick out maybe a handful that I make a decision that I'm going to write to deeply. Other people, when I don't have pen pals for them, I, I usually send them an article. I write a few words to their questions. I've told them that I will just do my best to keep them company as I keep them on the waiting list for a pen pal. When I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of people that write to us, I don't mean that they're all gay. Usually a lot of the gay uh, people that write, asking for help about practice, write to Gay Buddhist Fellowship, Hartford Street, Gay Men's Buddhist Sangha, like that. So this, this person writes, I've been in youth prison since I was 16. I grew up in an abusive family and got involved with a gang at 14, got into a fight and killed a man I was fighting with. Two weeks later, I tried to kill myself because I couldn't live with what I had done, and then I turned myself in at the age of 16. This is not unusual. I picked out some letters. I wanted to read some excerpts that are not unusual. They're pretty typical. But, and I picked out the ones that uh, I thought you might be particularly interested in and in that some people express to me that they're gay. Sometimes it takes them two, three years before they get to that place. So... This started in 1999 to 2005, so he writes at age 21. Also for the past year, I've been writing you, and I've decided that I want to dedicate my life to help achieve enlightenment and inner peace. Most of all, I want to help others achieve a happiness and peace that they don't have in here. But I don't know where to start. Almost, also, what does a shrine represent? like the seven bowls of water, and he describes more of what he understands the shrine should have. 
Also, I'd like to set up a shrine in my room of Buddha to remind me that anyone can achieve peace. But I don't want to have a shrine and not know the meaning. Also, when you told me that you joined the Zen Center, it was something that you just knew was right for you without any fancy answers. It's sort of how I feel that to learn Zen will help me be what I really am, not what I always thought I was. Like, I'm not a wrong person. I'm just gay. This was the first time he told me that. Does that make sense? I mean, I don't want to go live in the mountains until I find peace. I just want to help others be happy. I always tear up when I read this. And I mean, I grew up around violence and hatred, and I was always trying to make people happy since I was a kid. And I feel at ease with myself when I make others feel better. It's like I know what the pain feels like. So I would rather bear it for my mom, brothers, or sisters, so they can have some happiness. Even in here, if I see a new guy scared or someone sad, I'll always try to make them laugh, even if i got to make myself look like an ass. I don't know if I'm making any sense. I will have more questions next time. And can you send me some more chants? This is a 21-year-old, 20, although... Yeah, he wrote me this at 21. Mm -hmm. So I read that letter, and, you know, then I ask myself the question, how does my practice manifest in my life? He's a 21-year-old. He wants to practice for all beings. He wants to practice for his family. He wants to practice for the other people that come to the juvenile detention facility in which he's been living for a few years. That's his practice. Do I have questions when I entertain the possibility that I could write to somebody who's living behind bars? You bet I do. What do I have to offer? I've never been living, I haven't lived behind bars, except the bars, the prisons that I create in my mind. I've talked with Jim and Baruch about the possibilities of if there's a, you know, a group of people that get together that form this gay men's Buddhist prison network. Um, that maybe we would do half day or maybe an all day looking at the prisons of our own lives, the prisons we build in our own minds. Don't know. We surely would like to provide a, uh, a beginning training for people that may want to write. So I'm going to skip the Ram Das quote, although I love it. We sense what's called for, he says. Or if we don't and feel momentarily awkward, Someone comes quickly with an idea, and it's just right, and we're grateful. We take pleasure not only in what we did, but in the way that we did it. So many of us come together at our Buddhist practice places, come together with an awareness of our need for our communal support and compassion and kindness. And we become aware of how we can truly support each other. Truly support each other. And we can together ask the questions of ourselves. We can do that together. How are we being our spiritual principles? How does our practice manifest in the world? Does it manifest in the world? Like this 21-year-old kid? Even if I have to look like an ass, I want to bring some joy to somebody's job. Practicing, we have a saying in, in Zen practice that practice, maybe it's not just Zen practice, practice secretly like a fool, like an idiot. You know? This kid is embodying that. In, uh, in the book Queer Dharma, Mark Marion writes of his personal experience, and I just wanted to read this to you before I read you another quote from a letter. Uh, Mark Marion writes in a chapter called The Bad Buddhist and the Good Gay Heart. In my experience, gay people have a natural affinity for many of the central teachings explained in Buddhism. Non-separation, equanimity, impermanence, and non-duality. I don't know all of why this is true. Perhaps being outsiders, even within our own birth families, denies us the luxury of complacency and thrusts us face to face with a particular kind of loneliness. This separateness causes us to examine ourselves 
our relationship to the world, and examine the assumptions that those around us seem to take for granted. Which is a really good lead-in for me to read this excerpt from this letter. I pulled this from a very long letter. Being such a being in such a restricted situation as, as a minority, he's an African American who describes himself as black. The presence of loneliness is more pronounced than many would imagine. I'm a product of gangbanging generation, went through most of my life stuff in the real me into the tightest corner of my frustrations. <coughs> At age 16, I was sent to prison. Once there, I embraced the ethics of organized crime and became a member of the black gangsters, which is an easy way to remain immature by being violent, selling drugs, being racist. All the while, I was hiding behind an image and masking my sexuality without any real reason. I'm trying to find a moment of peace within myself and possibly outweigh the many bad deeds I've done with better ones. The reason I request a pen pal is because I'm just coming to terms with being a black man, a black gay man, with being gay, with being a man. I'm not seeking any relationship based on romance or finding, or finding financial help. The hope is for some guidance. Many of my questions are about my ideas and reactions to life that reflect my past experience, which is something I really need help changing. Sounds like anything we ask? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I guess this is a question. Um, it's basically just what you just read to us. Um, I, I was involved with a uh, pen pal exchange of a prison many years ago. And um, it got to the point where, where I, I didn't know what to say to the guy. I, I mean, uh, I, I was a middle class white guy who never had to deal with Russian film law or anything like that. Um, and, you know, I was thinking, well, you know, what can I say to this person? You know, I, you know like I can say, what I did this weekend, I went to a movie. I, took a hike on Mount Tam, or, you know. Um, but I, I, I felt awkward about that for, for two reasons. One, one was, would you even be really interested in hearing this stuff? And, and second, it would be kind of like, am I twisting a dagger about all these things I'm doing that he can't do? Because oh, he's what like, a compassionate question, right? It's really, the question comes from deep love and compassion and caring for another being. My experience, and this is why we would like to have a sangha that could meet together to talk about how do we deal with our own feelings of guilt for being on this side of the bars or having plenty when there's so many people who are on the other side that have nothing. Some people can't afford a stamp. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't feel guilt. I, I just don't... Excuse me for inserting that. Well, well, right, right. But, but, but I just feel, what do I have... To, to share with this person that, 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 question. Would, have, that would have an impact. Or, exactly or that question. Please help me understand your experience. I'm really interested. I'm sure your experience is different than mine, and I'd love to be educated if you're willing. Are you interested in hearing about some of my activities that you're not able to engage in because of your circumstance now? What does it raise for you? Let's talk about that together. Right. Exposing, exposing our questions, and then you see what happens. Like our practice, and then what happens? And then what happens? What I found is almost everyone I ask that question of um, is interested in what's going on in my life. I don't tell them so many details of my life, <coughs> just the right amount of details that I can express my practice, because that's what I'm most interested in um, offering to people in prison. What do I struggle with? What do I struggle with when I pass a person who doesn't have a home, who's living on the streets, and I decide whether I'm giving them money or a sandwich, or I don't give them anything and act as if they're not there? What is my practice? So, and oftentimes people will write how pissed they are. How do I practice when I get pissed? How hard is it? Really hard. How do I work with my reactivity? Like that. When I was at the dog park, 
I felt this really big crush of anger when that dog, big dog, came bounding over to me and snarled. Why did that person have that dog on a, on a leash like that? How did I work with that? Just like you told me, that big guy came at you and you thought he was going to uh, shove something into your body. How did you work with that reactivity? Wow. We both felt that sense of dangerousness. Here's how I worked with it. How did you work with it? Like that. The illusion of separation falls away when we just come from the place of, I don't know. I don't know. This is what comes up for me. This is what I've learned in my practice. Um, whose questions are these? They're not just ours. The people that are living on the other side of bars, we, they call us often free welders. They have the same questions we do. The questions may come out differently than we may ask in our polite society. But the questions are the same. Um, let me read this to you. First let me read this from Kobai, Kobai's book. Uh, Kobai Scott Whitney also has a chapter in here about right speech that I think is really excellent. I highly recommend it if you haven't read it. And he's written a book called Sitting Inside, Buddhist Practice in American Prisons. That's quite excellent. He quotes Dido Lori. One, thing's, one thing these students need to appreciate before they begin their work with the inmates was that they weren't bringing anything into the prison. This was uh, written for people who were leading meditation groups in prison. They weren't bringing anything into the prison. Everything needed was already there. Wisdom and compassion were already there. Where does wisdom come from? This is John Dido Laurie's question, longtime teacher. Where does wisdom come from? Each one of these inmates in his zazen was manifesting the enlightened life just as we were at the monastery. So he's also pointing to just sitting down and noticing what's really happening is practicing the enlightened life. We're already enlightened. Nothing fancy. Um, and so here is this that I want to read to you, an excerpt. How are you? This is, this, I was going to say this was written to a person, but this was written to me. I had moved, I'd lived at Green Gulch Farm, a part of San Francisco Zen Center for about four and a half years. Paul Haller asked me to come to the city center to do some specific work at city center. And so um, I had written to him that I thought I had made a really big mistake because I was so lonely. All of my friends were at Green Gulch Farm, and the noise of the city was driving me crazy. What had I done? <laughs> so he writes, how are you? It was nice to hear from you. I'm sorry you had moved. Change is always hard, <laughs> especially if we cling to feelings in the past, good or bad. In your letter, you say you feel very lonely there. I'm sure that will change for you real soon. Again, it's only your feelings that you're feeling. If it will help you, you can write to me any time you like. I'm also in a very lonely place. I'm also in a very noisy place. I try to live in the now and not let my feelings or mind get the best of me. I would like to tell you a little bit about me and I'll skip that part. And then he says, um, and then he says, um, this experience has not been real bad. No one likes prison. I've made the best of it with practice. I found myself, and I know it's okay just to be me. So I am. So I am gay. This is the first time he expresses this, and we have been writing for three years. So I am, underlined, so I am. So I am gay, and now it's time to move on. Thank you for writing of how you work out on your shit, too. <laughs> and so I'm going to stop with this so that we can have some questions and um, question of questions like that and I wish for all of us to work on our shit too 
I mean, that's my parting, my parting words of wisdom. Let's just keep working on that shit, too. Uh, so what are you, quite, I think we've got, what, around 15 minutes? Do we stop at 12? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about the security for these people in terms of the content of the letters, because I had a friend who was in jail for a while, and I would write him, and he was like, be careful what you write. You bet. Because anybody can have access to those letters, so... You bet. I had to really write in code and all this stuff. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, sometimes I get letters... In fact, a lot of times I get letters that have been open, letters written to me, and uh, they've already been opened and inserted inside the envelope is a little printed, small little printed thing like the size that you get out of a Chinese fortune cookie that says this was mailed from such and such correctional institution to make sure that the person that receives that letter understands that this person is writing from jail, danger, danger, like that. Um, and I do know that some of my letters are also open. If you send some prisons, you can't send more than three pages. If you send more, the letter is returned to you. A lot of reasons letters are returned. So it's very important to protect um, information that can be dangerous for others to know. Thank you very much for offering that. This is, this is what's helpful about supporting each other when we um, engage with this practice. Yeah. Um, so how many people are, are corresponding actively and, and what is the, the new prison project going to look like? Well, right now, the, the, we have at San Francisco Zen Center, we have around 200 people that are pen pals. Around 150 of them are very active pen pals. And um, what we do when a person is interested in being a pen pal, we send out the prison guidelines. Um, this is something that I'm hoping that Jim and Baruch will be doing for the Gay Men's Buddhist Prison Network. And, um, and we ask people to have a pseudonym. We ask people to not have prisoners write to you at your home address, not to <coughs> identifying information, to protect everybody. So we have a very large volunteer uh, contingent, but we still... I looked yesterday because I wanted to give you an accurate. There's still, I've got around 100 letters to which I haven't responded at all. Some of them are first requests, what do you do? Some of them are requests for a romantic relationship or money or like that. So I have a whole bunch of those. And then I've got a bunch of people that um, I've sent a first letter to or that I'm keeping company. And I probably have around 100 of those. And um, and then when people write to San Francisco Zen Center's address, I then look at the name that they're writing to, and I've got what I call a monster list. <laughs> it's really a master list, but it's a monster list. And I look at the person's pseudonym and then send it to their address. So it's a two-step. The person who's behind bars writes to an ad a public address, and then I send it on to their pen pal. We're very, we do not identify, give any identifying uh, information from our monster list, which is a whole other area of discussion around, well, why not? Right. Good question, why don't we? And we'll, we can talk about that. Does that answer your kind of a little more? Than sure, and so how, are there, how many people are there in the gay men's groups who are corresponding, or just a couple, or? I don't know. We have about half a dozen members of the Gay Men's Buddhist Sangha that have pen pals. So we've been encouraging that uh, as we can. And how about In the GBF, we don't officially have anybody, but I know that there are some members who do correspond sort of informally. Mm -hmm. so. it, it, it helps to know, too, if you identify as gay, it helps me to know that so that when a prisoner identifies as gay, because that not all prisoners write to uh, GBF or uh, GMBS. They'll write to us, and then after, when I hear that they're, they're gay, I ask them, would you like me to have, see if there's a volunteer? <coughs> and often, by that time, 
when people haven't talked about that, written about that, we've already bonded in some way. And that, oh no, not if not if that means you're not going to write to me. No, or I'm not interested. You you seem to accept me as I am. You know that I don't need a gay man. You know, like that. But I ask I ask the question. Yeah. Um, my name is Robin. Uh, Hi, I've Robin. been doing the mailing portion of, of the newsletter. Thank you so much. And I've seen a lot of uh, well, okay, here's, this is just a small, small collection of books. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so I relate to your hundreds and hundreds. And um, I'd say easily 50% of the letters we get are specifically asking for mail and, and a pen pal. Defer to you folks. Yeah, I see some of those are going to be coming my way. <laughs> but this is very exciting to me to see a lot of momentum going on here because we've tried many times over those years to get, some, get the ball rolling, and there are many resistances, and I understand them and <coughs> covered some of them. So just I'm very encouraged by this momentum that's building because some of these questions will be addressed through this new group. Um, but there's absolutely no shortage of gay men in prison with practices who need support. And so don't ever think there's nobody who wants to hear from you because there's a lot of it. There's even a couple of sanghas, gay men sanghas in prisons. Yes. That um, <laughs> would really appreciate hearing from us too. There's one I wrote to you uh, yesterday <clears throat> who says we have a small group. Mm -hmm. They all live in the same, or somewhat in the same unit. And he asked, um, he asked these questions, um, how do we work with the Four Noble Truths? And he asked, wonderful, wonderful beginner questions. And could you send us books and literature? I'm going to, what he's, he is becoming the group leader. I'm going to clear off a shelf in our unit's bookshelf. <coughs> and all we have is old, falling over fiction books. We don't have any television in our unit. Um, people go crazy in here. Could you send us books? <laughs> I'll be writing him back. One of the things that we need to learn when we get all of these letters is the question I ask myself, how do I work with this? All of these cries of the world, like Avalokita Shrara, some people call Avalokita Mary, some people Kanon, some Kuan Yin. How do we work with all of this? We listen to all of the cries, and then we do what we can. That's all. What other questions? We've got eight more minutes. Yeah. Lee, thank you very much for being here today. And, uh, I just want to be a resource for the hook that you're throwing out uh, to yeah. the Buddhist Fellowship members today. Um, I have done time. I've done two years in state prison. And uh, I was blessed in my experience of being one who received uh, letters literally every day that there was mail. Yes. To watch out in prison, you get nicknames or you get identified by behaviors really quickly. It was getting a little embarrassing because they were starting to call me letters. <laughs> and uh, um, I ended up with other names later. But, uh, <laughs> uh, they clearly were a, a resource and a life source, and um, yeah, empowering and encouraging. They became a part of uh, my daily practice of responding. So there was a clear sense of a relationship uh, that was happening and some ownership. You know, I felt the basic stuff of relationship, you know, accountability. They have written to me and they'll write back. Um, became a part of my spiritual practice and discipline to respond. And the letters that were the most meaningful to me were the ones where the writers shared their shit. <laughs> You know, they shared their questions, their struggles. And the walls, uh, the literal walls between us really started to, you know, disappear. And uh, 
there's that clears the book that we're all living time. And we're all living in illusions of some sorts. And the, the letters that were the most difficult were the ones of people who were still stuck in kind of the dualist idea that uh, I'm bad and they're good and they need to help me out. <laughs> and, um, and it was great practice to work with that energy also. So I also know in, in, in the prison yards that there's just a real heavy um, emphasis of, of Christian fundamentalism that tends to take over the yards. There's a strong pull for, for uh, men to convert uh, to Jesus, and it's always, it's, you know, it's the kind of right-wing fundamentalist material and it becomes just as vicious as, as anything. So um, as I became known on the yard as the teacher and also because I taught, that was my career and, and when I was in, um, you know, I also started to have a practice and for the first time, at least in my space, men were beginning to recognize that there were alternatives to the right-wing Christian hardline fundamentalism and you know the Bible-beating tradition that became really dominant on the arts. That became another area of practice for me because uh, I was perceived by the Christians as an enemy. So, um, a lot of dynamics, but it was just you know the common humanity is what meant so much to me. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the healing work that you do in the world. We will often get letters from people who feel forced into practicing Christianity or um, other other religious traditions that um, they are really not interested in, but it's a way to survive in the circumstances that people are in, and um, could, could, what could Buddhism offer me? Would I have to give up Christianity? Would I have to stop being a Muslim like that? No, you don't have to stop any of those traditions. You can include the practices that come from Buddha, but you don't, you don't have to define as a Buddhist. I know lots of Buddhists who are not Buddhists. You know, bodhisattvas, angels, call them whatever. <clears throat> the practices are the same. And a lot of what's taught in the jails and the prisons around um, religious traditions, including Buddhism, can be very <coughs> right-wing. You know, we Buddhists are not uh, any, any different than any other <laughs> religious bases. You do it this way. So... We have to be careful, and we have to in, encourage people to write to us their questions. And then we do our best to answer from our own practice. I've developed a lot of different articles that I send to people uh, who are writing to, to people behind bars to help see the territory for you, what you can write, what's your practice. It is now 11.58. <laughs> I just wanted to say uh, we have David Ezra here from GMBS and he works in the prisons so David's over there so if you want to talk to him later he can, Great. he can also tell you what it means for prisoners to uh, to get letters and, and I have sample letters uh, and what it, this practice has done for my practice so I can talk to you about that too so and I think Baruch has some... Well, I was just going to say, um, I recently went to a meeting of people who are involved in correspondence, that, you know, they're writing prisoners. And the thing that was very moving to me was how much it was a benefit to the people that were writing the letters. They all described that as um, a, a very huge benefit, like one of the biggest benefits that they had in the practice that they were doing. 
just really made some huge difference. And that was really inspiring to me. So we decided maybe we could offer this to other people <laughs> in our sangha who'd be interested. And it really does make you think about your practice and you have to go within and you have to think about, like we were saying, what do I have to offer? What can I, how can I respond? And so I think it could be useful to, it's a great benefit I think for us. Now, well didn't you set a date? Didn't we set a date for a meeting in July or in June? Or? Yeah, that's July. July 10th. Mm -hmm. So, July the 10th. If you're interested in coming to a meeting to delve into the questions, uh, you don't have to be, it isn't, coming to the meeting would not mean you are going to write. It could mean exactly the opposite. You can come to many meetings if you would like as you consider, is this how I wish to manifest my practice? Maybe this isn't how I wish to manifest my practice. And so that's like an organizational meeting, or that's going to be a workshop, or? Well, we don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to be, it's going to be from 7.30 to 9, at, I think, at San Francisco Zen Center, is the back of the dining room. And um, I think dinner is going to be supplied. And um, and we'll see what comes up. I don't know. We'll make it up together. We'll ask our questions. We'll express what we think. We'll ask more questions. Like that. <laughs> well, I think I think the time it's yes. twelve oh one. I'm a Zenny. Zenny's. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, thank you from all the Sangha. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Appreciate your efforts and uh, look forward to participating in this new network that is being established. I forgot something really important. I'm sorry. Go ahead. The, the San Francisco Zen Center is going to be in the uh, Pride Parade. <coughs> And we are in, and we're going to have a big banner. We also we're hoping the T-shirts will be ready that we're going to have that say, um, "Embracing the equality, uh, harmony." I can't remember exactly what it says. <laughs> Yikes! I've been working on it for so long. Anyway, we're going to have this really cool T-shirt that it is embracing all all beings. And we're, we have invited the Buddhist Peace Fellowship to join us. We're inviting all the sanghas, all the practice sanghas around to come to Pride Parade and be with us with a banner of Buddhists, you know, being in the parade together, proud to be here on this day. So if you're interested to know about where that group, uh, the, the planning group, which I'm meeting with this Wednesday, so I don't know where we're meeting yet, uh, are going to be meeting just look at our website, or call me, and I'll give you the information. Um, you can find out my calling information by asking some of these others here. That's all. I just wanted to get it in. You. Invite you to join us. We're really looking forward to it. Perfect segue to other announcements. Okay. Are just at this time in the program. Um, do we have an announcement? Yeah. Yes. Um, our speaker next week is going to be John Chu. Yeah. He is a Tibetan monk, and he's coming up from Lajparani Center to speak about Tibetan Buddhism. Do we have a host today? Yes, yes. I'm your host. Uh, we have tea. Just um, pick whatever you like, and there's some snacks. And there will be a Dhamma bowl um, going around, and so um, if you could be very generous, that would be really great. Uh, yeah, this is it in the newsletter. I'm just repeating it. On, on June 14th, I, I'm meeting a, a, a hike on Mount Tan. It's Saturday. And it's a very easy hike. It's down steep ravine trail, and it's all downhill. And when you start getting into your middle age, you think about things like that. Uh, and and uh, uh, you may be wondering why it has to be uphill eventually. And, and the answer is no, it doesn't. <laughs> um, we're, we're going to be meeting in Stinson Beach at the end of this hike and have a nice leisurely lunch in one of the cafes. And then we're, we're going to arrange it so, so there are cars down there so we can drive on back up to the park. <laughs> so, so you get to get some really pretty things without too much physical effort. <laughs> and I have flyers if you're interested. Is that the 14th? 
Yes, 14. Now, I ask you if you don't take a flyer unless you, you really are interested, because I only have a limited number. Any other announcements? Joe? Um, I'm hosting a GDF night for uh, production that I'm doing at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, <coughs> a piece called Wonder Boy. And there are flyers and info out there if you're interested. June 6th. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this Friday. This Friday. Yeah. 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 I just wanted to say I brought uh, some flyers or just some that have our June speakers for the Gay Men's Buddhist Sangha uh, in case anyone's interested. And also to point out uh, Albert, Albert Cobb is right in front of me. And Albert does the daily dharma and our weekly uh, activities uh, email. So if you're interested, talk to Albert. <coughs> There are no other announcements. We'll gather in a circle and have our dedication here. By the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity without too much attachment or too much aversion and live believing in the equality of all that lives. We dedicate the merit of our practice to all that lives. Thank you for Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, Please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.